thanks to all of you as well for for joining us a huge thank you to to marco and christina for um speaking and moderating at our last uh, news from the lab of 2021 so first of all i'd like to start by introducing christina now christina is a cern alumna she's also a nuclear and chemical engineer by training and she currently works as a technical program manager at google's technical infrastructure team keeping google's critical systems running worldwide despite hurricanes bandwidth outages and configuration errors uh, during a time at CERN, she quantified radiation damage to sensitive equipment and designed mitigation strategies to prolong its lifetime using Monte Carlo simulations. Her results informed critical upgrade decisions on collimators needed for the upcoming high luminosity era. During the long shutdown, she took care of the installation of new collimators, as well as the maintenance and commissioning activities on the existing ones getting the systems ready for a successful run three. Christina, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for the nice introduction. I think uh, we can go ahead and get started with Marco. Okay, good. So thanks a lot uh, to, uh, to, to, to Rachel and, and, and Christina for the invitation. So what I'm gonna uh, discuss with you, first a bit of introduction. So just to, to, to set this, the scene. So my name is Marco Calviani and uh, I'm the deputy group head of the STI group. So we are in charge of um, basically all the beam intercepting device that we have in the accelerator complex. And I'm gonna discuss a bit uh, this topic as well. Uh, we have several sections uh, in the group uh, uh, and uh, um, different jobs. One of them uh, is, is the section that uh, it's uh, related to beam matter interaction. So the section basically of physicists that uh, simulates how uh, particle beams interact with matter with Monte Carlo codes that, uh, that Christina was working on. And then with closely relation with my section that uh, we are in charge basically of the hardware components installed in the accelerator complex. We follow the entire life cycle of these components from the design to the construction, the procurement, uh, assembly, installation, operation, and then later dismantling. So Christina was also part of, of my section when she was working at CERN, and I was honored for that. And, uh, and then we have other section that deals with radioactive ion beams, mainly with the isolated facility. And we have another section which leads with the laser and photocathodes, which are also supporting the operation resolved in other facility at CERN. So the focus I will do to today, so the initial title was Challenges and Perspective for Target System for High Intensity and High Energy Machines. Uh, I tried to revise that a bit, the topic, to, to make it a bit more uh, interesting. So beam intercepting devices at CERN. So I will, uh, I will start with a bit of disclaimer. So it's a bit of a phenomenological and broader approach to design, construction, and operation of beam intercepting device. And uh, these are based, these uh, slides are based on an academic lecture which I've given a month ago uh, here at CERN. So you have the two slides, the two links here with the slides uh, and, uh, and they're also recording. So there's a much more detail. So here we'll touch just a couple of topics. Uh, and I already touched very, very high level the topics of the academic lecture. So today they will be even more high level, but uh, uh, please feel free to ask questions or, or whatever. So I will start first attempt uh, of a definition of what is a beam intercepting device. So it is a component, a uh, system that intercepts accelerator particle beams with different purposes and objectives, could be for production of secondary beams, secondary particles. Um, for example, we use a proton beam to impact onto something to produce an antiproton beam for the AD physics. This is generated by a production target, and that's why we're calling it target. Um, other function of this device could be to protect sensitive equipment. This is, for example, what we do uh, in, the, in the LHC with, uh, with collimators that uh, were mentioned before. What Christina has also participated to during the, the LS2. So these are mechanical device that intercepts a certain fraction of the proton beam or intercepts the showering generated by interaction of the beam with a collimator. Uh, and there are other category of device which are basically used for safe disposal of beams, particle beams, and these are called dumps or absorber depending on the specific function. So um, uh, I, I put here something, I think it's a bit. Well, so this is just the classification of these components. So it's just what I've just, uh, I've just said. I will give uh, a part of, of an initial introduction a bit on the physics and the methodologies that we have to, to, to build these components. I will also give a couple, only a couple of examples. And I try to enter a bit more in detail to understand a bit the, 
physical and, and, and engineering aspects behind this. Uh, I will give an example of a, of a particle producing target, specifically of a neutron production target, and I will give an example of a beam dump, in specific case, the main dump of the, of the LHC. So this is just a couple of pictures. I spotted some of them. I think the first one is the uh, top left. Uh, so you see Christina here on, on, on one of the device installed uh, in a machine during LS2. This is an absorber uh, uh, made out of steel. Uh, this is not a movable collimator, but it's an absorber that protects the, uh, basically um, um, a, a magnet, which is located downstream. And I think this goes in line to what Rachel was introducing Christina. So Christina made the calculation with Fluca Monte Carlo, with the Fluca Monte Carlo code when she was working in the BMI section. And then when she came to my section, basically she built that and installed that in the machine. So I think it's a nice uh, um, example. Then on the top right, you see uh, an absorbing core of a beam stopper. So the beam stopper is a device that protects uh, personnel against the beam impact when we access secondary areas. In this specific case here, the beam comes from the left and impacts the dump, the absorber from the left to the right. So what you see here is a four disc of Inconel uh, 718, which is a very strong absorber material with relatively high density, followed by a, a basically a copper alloy, which acts as a heat sink for the beam that gets deposited. And on the bottom left, you see, and, and on basically the bottom part, you see um, a beam dump. So this is the beam dump of the SPS. It's a big beast uh, that has to absorb quite a large amount of, uh, of energy and power. Um, it's, uh, it's a five meter long device. This is composed by a graphite absorber, which is uh, basically embedded uh, into a, um, a copper chromium zirconium absorber, which is cooled by water. Okay, So it's a very complex uh, component. Uh, and you see this uh, that is going to be in in this picture, it was going to be inserted into a, a huge seamless vacuum chamber that acts as containment for the dump. And then all the assembly then uh, it's, uh, it's put in a, in a very big uh, sort of marble cathedral, because what you see here is really marble to reduce uh, activation. It is installed in the SPS, and it's really the location where we dispose the high energy beam from the SPS machine. Just a couple of examples. So what type of challenges do we have to face when doing that? So the beam intercepted devices are such that we have to withstand both uh, normal operation as well as accident scenarios. So it needs to withstand all potential scenarios of the proton beam in a safe way. It needs also to protect delicate equipment. So for example, a collimator has to protect uh, uh, superconducting magnets, which can quench just with some uh, a uh, few milliwatt uh, per cubic centimeter. And here we're talking about megajoule uh, of, of, uh, of energy, as you will see later on. So sometimes they are the last line of defense against components damage. For example, in the specific case, uh, um, uh, components like quadruples or, or dipoles or any magnets in the LHC. Uh, and, um, and, and usually they are also the most radioactive components in the accelerator complex, okay? Because you dispose of lots of proton beam, you create a cascade, you create neutrons, and the neutrons are usually the components which tend to activate most uh, the, the components, especially things like stainless steel, for example, it's very bad for, uh, for radioactive. So, mm, uh, and then, voila, so I, I hear just really a bit more in detail on the challenges that we have to make. So this component needs to operate in ultra high vacuum of the machine. So there needs to be, and in some cases you also have movable components. So, so you need to have movable components in the ultra high vacuum. Um, uh, and the absorbing part of the beam intercepting device needs also to be able to absorb high energy densities. I'm talking about kilojoule per cubic centimeter per pulse, which is an enormous amount of energy. And in some of the cases, you need to also deal with the extremely high power densities, especially when you have uh, uh, high levels of repetition rates. Okay. And I will give an example here of the high energy density, taking example one of the production target. And uh, uh, we have other challenges, which uh, are high, it's high beam kinetic energy. So this is really the application here of collimators and mainly of the LHC beam dump, for which I will give an example. Again, here talking about enormous amount of, of energy, the specific case of the LHC beam dump in high Lumiera, this will have to digest let's say 700 megajoule in 80, 90 microsecond, which is an enormous amount of instantaneous power. In some cases, we have to deal with high average deposited power in the order of hundreds of kilowatt. And, so, and, and, and in some cases, especially the production target, we have to deal with very specific physics requirements with impedance and radiation damage. So there's a large amount of, 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 of challenges that we have to face. Then we have a very, I think it's very important because 
the, uh, uh, the uh, careful control of the life cycle of our components is critical for the successful operation of our components. So we, we usually start with uh, very good functional requirements. This is very important because it defines basically the scope of our activity that it helps us going into conceptual design. We sometimes, and in most of the case, we do some R&D activity that is required to reach the functional specification, coupled with prototype and testing to validate the technology that we want to implement. Then we go to the phase of advanced design, procurement and construction, of course, is a critical part, the commissioning uh, uh, prior uh, to BEAM, commissioning with BEAM. Then, of course, we go to a sort of operational phase where they have to do the job that we have been requested and defined in the functional specification. Uh, we need to maintain these components. And, uh, and then we also have to take into account the disposal, meaning the radioactive waste disposal. So this is becoming more and more uh, important. And of course, this is a, a, a closed loop. So the, because clearly the operational feedback is essential to design reliable components for the next generation. Okay? So, so there are a lot of boundary condition. Again, I'm, I, it, it's a very complex uh, and I say iterative process. And uh, most of the case we have to comply with several requirements. And in most of the case, the data set is incomplete when we start, okay? So of course we have to take into account the integration and localization constraints. In some case, this device goes into the tunnel. In some other, these are installed in the ultra high vacuum. Sometimes they are installed outside of the vacuum. Sometimes they're installed in dedicated caverns. So each, each time we have different requirements, we need to take into account about thermomechanical stability of our components, material damage, both instantaneous and long-term, which affects lifetime reliability. We need also to take into account operational availability. This is a key uh, keyword, especially in this, uh, this moment. Uh, we also need to take into account safety for personal and for the machine, especially for the personal during intervention, because these are radioactive, and for the machine, because they must not fail during beam. And of course, we need to take into account handling because again, these are radioactive, accessibility for maintenance and general maintenance consideration parts that needs to be regularly exchanged must be accessible uh, during operation. So, <clears throat> so uh, well, what type of information do we need to build that? Uh, uh, first of all, the beam profile, it's a, it, it's a very critical point because we have your primary beam impacting on your absorbing part. And clearly depending on the size and the shape of the impinging beam, you have different response of material and, and, and device. Here you have a couple of examples. So you have uh, on the first picture on the left here, you have an example of, maybe I can put the laser, maybe it's better seen here. I don't know. Uh, I cannot do that. Okay, whatever. Um, on uh, here, you, you have an example where you have a relatively large beam. It's a rastered beam. This is not a beam that we can do here at CERN because this is made out of a facility in the, in the US that shows how you can make a very round beam, a relatively large beam. And the middle part, you have one of the beams that can be reached at the higher atmat facility at CERN that we use for testing components. So it's a highly elliptical beam, which is very, very small on the vertical plane and slightly large on the horizontal one. This is one of the beams that can be obtained. And another example is the one in the picture on the right that sees how diverse it is. So this is the beam dilution of the, of the proton beam, of the LHC proton beam impinging on the LHC beam dump. Okay, so you see that the dimension of the dilution is relatively large. So here we're talking about something in the order of 25 by 20 or even more by 40. So it's a relatively large beam and we have to do this dilution because otherwise we will just break the dump in one single pulse because the absorbing material will sublimate uh, over a single bunch. So one critical important point, as I was mentioning before, is the beam matter simulations because you have different types of interaction uh, and the interaction mechanism that depends on a variety of things of the space that interacts, of the energy of this particle, the impacting material, the, ma the atomic mass, the atomic number, the density. So there is really a, a plethora of different consideration. What I want to stress here, and this is a nice uh, picture from, 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 from Anton, is that this picture basically shows the beam, ener the beam uh, energy deposition profile as a function of energies for two specific cases. This is on graphite but uh, it shows the, how diverse it is. So the one on the top, it shows what is the effect of energy deposition of a 160 MeV beam onto graphite. So you can clearly see what everybody knows as the break peak. So you have the break peak at this relatively low energy, but when you move to higher energies, in this specific case, it's the SPS beam and the injection of the LHC, 
so SPS ejection. So you see that, uh, first of all, the penetration of the beam is much longer. So here we're talking about like four meters of penetration for your beam, while in the case of, of 160 MeV beam, this is what, it's 20 centimeter, not even 20 centimeter. And you can clearly see that here you don't have a, a, a black peak because your beam showers, it creates secondary particles, and therefore the concept of, of range, if you want, in matter doesn't, doesn't uh, it has no physical meaning anymore. So again, I'm not going to enter into the detail, but basically this energy deposition uh, um, um, basically, and the resulting Coulomb interaction basically creates a vibration in your atomic structure, in your molecule, and therefore creates a temperature increase. Basically, this means, if you want to translate that in engineering terms, that part of the energy that interacts, that comes from the beam and interacts with your device, is converted into thermal energy. So, in most of the cases, not always, this occurs basically instantaneously. So, you can directly relate the energy deposition with a sort of an adiabatic temperature rise uh, in your material, which depends on the on the density and the specific heat. So, just to give you a feeling of what types of energy we're talking about, so this is a case of the SPS beam dump where we have our beam kinetic energy, which is in the order of five megajoules, which is again, still a significant amount of energy. But then if you translate that into repetition rate, so basically to power, uh, in the case of the LIU dump, so the one that we have installed during the shutdown, this results basically in an amount of power of around 230 kilowatt, which does not seem to be enormous, but if you consider the volume of our components and the fact they need to operate into ultra high vacuum, it's really a challenging amount of energy. And then I make another example, which is the LHC beam dump. So in this specific case, we don't really have average power because we dump every well, few hours. It depends. It could be even shorter than that. The challenge is here is that is the instantaneous energy, which is carrying the kinetic energy of your impinging beam. So in this specific case, uh, if you take the example here of this parameter, which is going to be equivalent to what we're going to have in round three, so starting from next year, we're talking about an energy of 440 megajoules. And this is an enormous amount of energy, which is carried by the beam, because this amount of energy is basically enough to melt two and a half tons of copper. So this is really an enormous amount of energy that we have to deal with. And this creates other challenges, which I will say later on. I think I'll go I'll skip on because I think I'm, I'm a bit late in what I wanted to, 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 to say. I just want to stress here one important point is the way we remove the heat from our devices. In this specific case, this is a, a cross-cut view of the SPS beam dump. And basically, you see how the beam is painted on the dump. So the beam here is diluted as well. It's not a single spot because otherwise we will break the graphite. So this is painted on the graphite and clearly the heat that is deposited on the graphite needs to be diffused away to something that can, can carry out this uh, energy that is deposited on the dump. And here clearly we have several barriers between the heat and the water. In this specific case, we have a first barrier of, between the graphite, the copper, and we have a second barrier between the copper and the stainless steel. So in engineering terms, is we have a very daunting task of trying to improve this as much as possible. You know, in the past, the SPS was at 50 kilowatt average power. Now we passed to 240 uh, and, and this of course, created uh, extra challenges and, 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 and new definition new technologies. Then of course we have other means of cooling, but I think I will, I will skip this in the interest of time. And uh, uh, what I want to show onwards, I think I'll skip a couple of points. Uh, I just want to maybe show this one. So this shows a bit the feeling on the response of our material. So this is again is the case of the SPS beam dump. So this is a piece of graphite or a piece of copper chromium zirconium, which is after the graphite I showed you before. So basically, this is the effect that the beam has, that the energy that is carried out on the beam does on the, on, 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 on the material. The specific case, this during a transient scenario, we reach around 340 degrees. And, uh, and, and, and then basically, this leads also uh, to challenging uh, parameters for, uh, for our uh, copper alloy, uh, because this at every shot, it means that you get slowly plastification of our material, which of course is not very good uh, for the long-term operation of our components. But this is what it is. I mean, we have to deal with, uh, to anticipate the power that we have to, to manage. 
Um, one other point is that uh, uh, most of our components are designed to work in the elastic regime. So basically it means that our material, once it's subjected to some amount of energy, it goes back after the beam finishes, it goes back to an initial situation as you know, starting with sort of pristine material, because of course this gives and improves the reliability of our components, okay? Because we want a beam intercepting device to stay in the machine for as much as possible. But sometimes you may have uh, scenarios in which it could be a beam impact accident or even normal operation can provoke permanent deformation of our components. And we enter basically into a sort of what we call plastic regime, which is basically a damage which is reversible that will not go back to a prior situation. This is an example that we get here on the right, the picture that you see here. So this is a, an injection absorber, uh, uh, um, basically from SPS to LHC. It's a sort of a movable dump. Uh, that we have in the machine. So here in the central part is the absorbing material. This is graphite. And here on the, on the, on the two extremities that you see nicely bent by several centimeter, this is an RF screen, which is, was made by copper, which was permanently deformed by the heating of the entire internal chamber of the TDI. Of course, this is not normal in operation. This may create problem for the beam circulation and for this therefore has to be avoided. Another example is that uh, uh, is the picture that you see after. So you may have uh, cases in which the instantaneous power is so high that you enter in a sort of shockwave regime. And here on the bottom right, you see what could happen onto a, this is in the specific cases, a rod of, of iridium, which is an extremely high Z material, which would be used for antiproton production. You clearly see the effect of bulging induced by the beam interacting on this. Uh, on this material, okay? So, and, and, and this uh, one, I just wanted to show you that uh, basically for, for the construction of these components, we really have, um, we really have to employ a variety of different materials, which characterized by a lot of um, different parameters, okay? So we start in our case from graphitic material, Christina knows them very well because we use them in collimators, not only collimators. So graphite, graphite is very good because it has a very low, coefficient of thermal expansion, relatively good conductivity, it has low density, therefore low energy deposition, and it has a very high operational temperature. You can use graphite up to thousands of degrees, and it has very good robustness to beam impact. So we use that usually for the absorbing part of our component. We also use aluminum because clearly it has a good thermal conductivity. However, we, use, we tend to use aluminum more in the past uh, because, uh, because it has good thermal properties and because the cost is, re is reasonably low, but it has two negative points, it's at an extremely low melting point. And uh, also, as, much, as, as soon as you go above 100 of degrees, you basically lose all the mechanical properties of, your, of the standard aluminum alloys. We also use titanium a lot. Titanium is an excellent material. It's very strong. It has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion, but at the same time, it has low thermal conductivity, which is the same thing as stainless steel or steels in general, uh, which of course is the king, uh, I would call it the structure material, but is characterized by very low thermal conductivity. Now we go into a bit of a fancier ones. Uh, I mentioned before copper, chromium and zirconium, which is uh, an alloy with, of copper, of course, with chromium and zirconium. Uh, this has an extremely good heat conductivity, which is the same as pure copper. But contrary to copper, this alloy has good strength and stability at high temperature. Okay, So we use that extensively in our beam intercepting device. And especially for collimator, we use also another alloy of copper, which is called Glidcop, where some nickel is inserted because we have to brace. So we need a specific composition. Uh, and then we move to the materials which works well at say at high temperature, well, not all of them, but at least most of them, we have molybdenum alloys, tantalum, tungsten, and iridium. So these have different properties depending on our application. We have a specific case there in the middle, which is lead, uh, which is relatively high density. Of course, it's very bad in terms of temperature operation because the melting point is relatively low, it's 330 degrees. We use that for neutron production. I will I still have some time, I will give you this example. Um, so it's perfect really for neutron production, but it's clearly that especially pure lead has a, a very poor uh, mechanical properties. So, so I think I'll skip this one. I, I, I just want to may, maybe raise this point because it's very relevant for, for what we do. So, so radiation protection consideration is very essential for our components because these have uh, impact on operation and on the waste uh, themselves. 
uh, we usually, the general principle which are dictated by radiation protection is that we should use material with low activation, for example, stainless steel with low cobalt. Uh, we have to avoid toxic materials like beryllium and lead. Of course, not all of these can be met at the same time because in some cases, for example, we have to use beryllium for production targets. So we have uh, in the North Avia here at CERN, we have four target stations and they're all operating with beryllium targets. But this is again for physics reasons. And again, as I said before, we have uh, lead as a production target in case of neutron production. And then, of course, when we have to design a component, we need to take into account several radiation protection consideration is the prompt and residual radiation. We have to take into account the activation of the air that is around our women's set device, which get activated by the production of neutrons. Um, we have activation of water and ground. Could be the water that cools our components, or it could be the water that is around our tunnels. And we have to take into account the radioactive waste consideration as well. We also have ultra high vacuum that needs to be taken into account. Um, um, this puts several constraints. For example, for movable parts, we cannot use lubrication in the ultra high vacuum because it could be a potential source of leaks, of virtual leaks in our components. And uh, in most of the case, our component need, needs to go to high temperature, or let's say, are forced to go to high temperature induced by the beam deposition. And of course, going to high temperature increase the outgassing of, of residual gases from inside the components. And, uh, and, and the use of graffiti material, which is imposed by the energy density that we have to deal with, is clearly incompatible with most of the case with vacuum, because graphitic material is a very porous material and uh, um, incorporate humidity when it's built and then outgas when it's the ultra high vacuum. So um, uh, I think I will just go now to the example because I think I, maybe I can come back to some of these examples uh, if you're interested. Uh, I, I, I just want to show some example of components. Yeah, the first one I want to talk about the NTOF. So this is a production target. So to talk a bit more concrete, on some of our stuff. So at CERN, we operate a wide neutron source, a wide neutron spallation based source. Basically, we impinge the PS beam, 20 GV beam on lead production targets. This produces a lot of neutrons um, uh, that goes into two facilities or two experimental areas one 200 meters downstream the production target, basically horizontally, and another one that goes vertically, on, really on top or to the surface. And um, this comes from an idea of Carlo Rubbia, which, uh, let's say, proposed this facility at the end of the 90s. It was built in the early 2000s, and now we, we, we just finished the celebration of the 20 years of this, uh, of this installation. So, so um, um, this is the neutron fluence that is produced. I mean, we always, you can hear a lot of neutron production sources around the world. Uh, what is specific in this specific case, in this case of the Antoff facility here at CERN is that the neutron fluence uh, uh, ranges from uh, hundreds of GV down to thermal energy. So it spans basically 11 orders of magnitude in a single pass. So, and this is really key to the type of physics that needs to be done by the Antoff collaboration that cannot be done else, else, elsewhere in the world, even in the high power facilities. So, so um, we use lead. Uh, because the experiment requires an extremely low gamma background, so the photon background that is generated by the spallation products, and it needs to have also an extremely high neutron to proton yield, so the amount of neutron that you get by impinging proton. And lead, especially pure lead, is the best possible material because an extremely high neutron cross-section, elastic cross-section, so basically once you, means what? It means that once you produce a neutron inside your production target, this starts to do a ping pong inside your lead material, but without losing energy, okay? So you will not, once you produce it at a given energy, you don't lose it around uh, and therefore not reaching the experimental area. And also it has a very low inelastic cross-section. This means that when it does this ping pong, uh, uh, the absorption rate, let's say, is extremely low with respect to other material as, for example, tungsten. So we run with two generation of production targets, a neutron production target based on lead. The first one was operated for four years, basically, and the other one that just finished before LS2 operated for 10 years. So they were all uh, lead based. They had all of them a bit of challenges of operation. The one here on the left, uh, you can see how the target looked like after four years of operation. So you can clearly see that it changed color. Uh, 
Uh, you can also clear here, see the, the, the point where the beam has impinged. The beam has trailed basically a hole through the lead. And also you can see based on this difference that the lead is basically moved during operation. Uh, because as I said, the lead is extremely uh, plastic material and uh, very low mechanical resistance. So it basically moved under its own weight. The second generation was uh, a slight improvement over the first generation target, but still had some operational challenges. Then in, during this shutdown, we built a new generation. So it's based again on lead, but instead of being cooled by water like the previous one, now it's nitrogen cooled. So we developed a whole new technology uh, to do that. Uh, to my knowledge, we never had a, a production target based on nitrogen cooling. Uh, I mean, we never cooled lead with, uh, with, with nitrogen. We had several innovation in, in introducing the design, basically to increase the reliability over the long term. Uh, and, uh, and the target has been built. There has been a very complex physical engineering design process. This is not only the case for a production target like that, but it usually applies um, uh, uh, to all components that need to be designed, that they need to intercept the beam. So usually start with an integration with Katia, which is with a 3D um, design uh, model. Then of course we uh, prove or validate our production techniques with the workshop that has to build that. So we want to see or make sure that what we design is buildable before we go on into the detailed design. And then we have, of course, we have a phase where uh, the target is optimized based on the physics performance that it has to deliver because at the end this is the function that it needs to make so this is the a key aspect for us so this we do with the fluca monte carlo code that is developed here at CERN then this generates heat loads so the beam as i said before deposits energy heats up the material so this uh, it's taken as a heat load into the finite element analysis uh, models. We use ANSYS in the specific case, and we deal with thermal management, so establishment of the cooling method, uh, heat transfer coefficient, which then are fed into the mechanical design and the mechanical performance, the thermodynamical performances. Um, I think I can skip this one. This is uh, an example of how we monitor our components. Of course, once we installed it and it received beam, we want to make sure uh, that it operates as we want, okay? So in this specific case, the target was equipped with thermocouples. Huh? We had six of them. Three of them were installed really in the beam direction, so they could really see the showering of the beam. And three of them were a bit on the side. So, and here, this is shown in this uh, plot, especially in this uh, square here, we, we, you basically see, um, basically you should read here temperatures a function of time and it has this sawtooth behavior which is really the effect of the beam so every increase of temperature that you see is really the beam impact on on our production target and you can see this uh, roughly 10 degrees of that uh, of delta t uh, that is measured every time the beam impacts so basically the beam impacts it goes up the temperature because of the deposition of the energy and then the temperature goes down due to the effect of the, the conduction in the target and also due to the fact that the target is actively cooled with nitrogen before it reach another uh, uh, another uh, pulse um, and then I just want to make a small digression. I think this is very, I think it's very important that this is uh, clarified even for you that left the organization. But it, it's it's very important that at least for us, we really make sure in most of the cases we upgrade the device uh, uh, in already existing areas. So not all of the time we build new infrastructure. In most of the cases we reuse existing infrastructure and upgrade with new components. So of course we need to maximize the existing infrastructure because it's a lot of investment that was done in the first place. Uh, however, when we do that on, uh, on, on beam intercepting device, the additional challenge is the, is the residual dose rate. So how radioactive is our component? And in some of the cases also contamination risk. So I, I want to take the example of the of, of NTOF because in this specific case, we removed a very radioactive and contaminated production target in order to make space for the new, for the new target. So we try to maximize uh, ALARA processes so as low as reasonably achievable. And we do that by using remote handling with monorails or cranes, and also with the use of telemanipulation, in this specific case with robots, and I'll give you an example with that. So this is, uh, I'm not going to enter into the detail, but basically here, if we wanted to remove this uh, production target, which is at the end of a vertical shaft, we needed to remove all the vertical ductwork here. So the size that you see here is roughly 10 meters of ductwork. 
which is uh, uh, was radioactive and contaminated with spallation products. So the intervention in the pit, you see here, uh, one of our colleagues, which is dismantling this pipe, it's extremely challenging, first of all, because of the um, uh, cramped space where we have to work and also the risk of contamination that we have. And, uh, and in the next slides, you will see an example of extensive use of, uh, of robotic tools. So in this specific case, we needed to cut um, a four vertical uh, pipe that uh, were contaminated. We couldn't do that in, with, with human intervention because again, contamination was relatively high. So here we use a couple of robots here with which CERN is equipped now. Uh, one of them was holding the pipe in position. And here you see the big one that is holding in position while the smaller one had a, a sort of a saw, not this other saw, sorry, a sort of a, a, a fork, uh, and a, a, uh, that that is actually actually cutting the steel pipe here um, and and basically severing the connection, uh, but by making a way that the tube uh, uh, close on itself and therefore reduce the risk of external contamination. And here we have one of our radiation protection colleagues that comes, packs this, this pipe, then to use for final uh, for final storage. And then uh, I think you can see this, uh, the severing of the pipe. I think in the next one, I probably wait before passing to the next one, because I think it comes now and we do well, the additional duct work. I think there is a close up view now, if I'm not mistaken. Voila, voila. So you can clearly see here the severing of this uh, pipe uh, and, and this cuts it by also closing on itself. Okay? This is something that we couldn't do if the intervention would have been done by human because we would have used a saw basically. And uh, so this was very successful and we used the robot extensively also for other activities in this project. So here you saw, you, you can see the monorail uh, remotely removing the target from the pit. Again, we couldn't get much close to this device because uh, in contact with the target, we have we we had basically on the order of several twenties, twen tens, sorry, of millisievert per hour, which is very high, especially with the risk of alpha contamination. And also here we have the example of the robot taking some smear test to measure the level of surface contamination. And here this is the one of the last steps that we did. Basically, we put the target into a an ad hoc container that we built in order then to. Uh, 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 basically um, close it for final disposal. So okay, this is just an example on, on, on the life cycle of this. And then the last example I want to give you because it's very special, I think you've never seen that, is uh, the LHC main, 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 main dump. So as I said before, we have to deal with energies of hundreds of megajoules, so an extremely high amount of, 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 of kinetic energy. So, and uh, in this, in this figure, in this, um, sort of this table here, what you see is that uh, let's focus here on the on the on this row here that I'm highlighting, which is the energy of the beam in megajoule. So you can see that at the end uh, of uh, uh, the run two, basically in 2018, we had the dump had to deal uh, on the order of 320 megajoule. But starting from next year, basically 2022, this energy will jump to 400 and 540, and then in the high lumi era, this will jump to 680. Megajoule. So this is an, an enormous amount of power that we have to deal. The dumps are located in 0.6, so it's in the middle of nowhere uh, in Versonne. Um, so so the, um, basically, if you, if you have been there or if you have looked at the area, you would see that tangential 2.6. We have two long straight, we have, of course, the LHC tunnel that he bent, but we also have two tangential uh, uh, tunnels. Uh, which goes into uh, two caverns, one here and one over there for beam one and beam two, in which at the end we have the main absorber of the LHC and the LHC beam dump, uh, which is this device here. So the dump itself is constituted by a graphite absorber, which is roughly eight meters and a half uh, long and 700 millimeter in diameter. In the actual design, this is embedded into a, a thick stainless steel tube made out of a duplex alloy. This is not standard. Uh, stainless steel, which is also part of the problem. And it's filled with nitrogen gas slightly above atmospheric pressure. So the dump is, is so long because it needs to absorb a lar the largest fraction of the proton beam that impinges on it. Here you see the fraction that, uh, that uh, of the protons that interacts on the dump undergoes this number of inelastic interaction with the core. It's composed by uh, several grades of graphites. I'm not going to enter into detail because this is also part of the challenge. Um, uh, 
and uh, the dump itself, oops, sorry, dump itself is installed into a, a, into a, a shielded assembly. And uh, um, basically, uh, uh, well, at the end of these two extraction line. And this device is, uh, is extremely important because it allows for really the safe disposal of the bin. It's the only device in the LHC that is capable of digesting, let's say, all this uh, amount of, uh, of energy. And this is coming back to what I saw at the very beginning. This is how the beam is dumped onto the dump. So it's painted onto the surface, oops, sorry. I went too far. It's 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 painted on the surface of the graphite and on the surface of the front window, which is made out of, of, of titanium. And this paint is done over a time period of 90 microseconds. So wh why we care about this? This is because in the last year of operation of Run 2, so from 2016 to 2018. We saw an, an increasingly, uh, 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 let's say, an increased amount of operational challenges that we have in this device. In particular, we have nitrogen leaks on a regular basis from, from, from the dump. Of course, we don't want nitrogen to leak because we have nitrogen inside the dump to prevent graphite oxidation. Because if we have oxygen in contact with graphite uh, at a thousand degrees, uh, we produce CO2 and therefore basically uh, uh, dissipate graphite. So we, we risk of reducing the mass of graphite in our dump. And also we observe massive movement of the dump. So this device weights around eight tons and, and we found it moved by centimeters, okay? So what we saw in instruments that we put, uh, so we saw this level of vibration. So we have point-to-point -point displacement uh, of all the entire assembly in the order of 100 microseconds. So it's huge displacement for the amount of mass that we have. And in addition to this, uh, let's say, fast effect, we also have uh, um, a slow movement of the dump. So I, I, I want to... Uh, be, you to be careful to the scale. So here again, we are talking about, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, while in the case on the right, we're talking about hours, okay? So the entire scale is 16 hours. So you can see that we have um, over 30 minutes, we have an expansion, uh, sort of an expansion of the entire dump by, let's say, a millimeter at these energies here, which then takes several hours to contract back to original position. So and we were wondering why we had this observation and uh, one of the explanations here. So basically out of the entire uh, uh, energy, in the specific case uh, of run three, so starting from next year, out of the 440 uh, megajoule that is stored in the beam, there is an, a, quite a large amount of it, 420, which is deposited in the dump block. Most of it goes into the graphite, so this very large absorber inside, but there is a relatively small fraction, still quite high in absolute terms, this specific case 20 megajoule, that gets deposited into the stainless steel shell, okay? The stainless steel shell is like 12, 12 millimeter thick, so it's very thin, if you may say so, and this amount is, of energy is very high for this amount of shell. And uh, what happens, and I, I'll, I'll show you later on, is basically that this shell starts to... Um, um, uh, expand and contracts very rapidly over this short time scale and create sorts of entire vibration of the assembly. Um, this amount of energy that gets dumped to the dump, it's done sometimes very often, okay? On the top part, you see a normal day, or say a good day as Anton here has, has, has noticed. So here in, in, uh, in red and blue, you have the intensity of the beam into the machine as a function of time. So you can see that the, the machine start feeling, ramping up, and then collisions start in the experiment. So you have a certain amount of burn off of luminosity until the moment we dump the beam. In this specific case, it was 150 megajoule. Because of course, even if you inject, let's say 300 megajoule, then part of this energy gets lost in the collimators, get lost in the, in, in the, in the experiment, gets lost somewhere everywhere in, in the machine. And there is a certain fraction uh, say 50% that gets dumped at the end of the device. But in some cases, you may have dumps occurring relatively often uh, shortly after the beam is injected. And this is an example here of something that occurred in 2017 where we were dumping quite a lot of energy on a regular basis. And I just want to let you hear what is the effect of the beam onto the dump. So what you're gonna hear is a beam event of 120 megajoule uh, which is basically roughly five times less than what we will have in front three. And you will realize that it's already quite a lot of energy.
I hope it works. Oh, uh, no, sorry, I didn't want to show you this. I'll try again. Ah. So this sort of, I hope you heard this bang, and the bang is basically really the dynamical effects of the dump, of the beam impacting on the dump, and the expansion and contraction of this assembly over hundreds of nanoseconds. And this is a basically exemplified here. So this is a complex simulation. I just want to, to show you the, the, the most important part. So the picture here on the top left basically shows you the fast expansion of the dump uh, that occurs in the, in the central part. It's highly asymmetric uh, because the beam, it's not, uh, let's say, illuminating the vessel in an uniform way all around. It's really peaked in the central part and it gets reduced uh, when we get to the extremities. And on the right part, you see the top, you see the evolution of the, uh, uh, of the temperature in the dump. So you get this profile at 90 microseconds, so at the end of the beam impact, you reach, let's say, 1,500 degrees, which is the maximum temperature in the graphite. But still, this heat, which again is like 400, 400 megajoule, it needs time to diffuse out from the graphite to the external vessel. And this specification shows that it's still uh, 12 hours after the dump, albeit the dump is relatively cooled, not very efficiently, but still it is cooled, we still have uh, more than 50 degrees in the graphite after 12 hours. And this is another dynamic simulation that shows you this effect. So this fast expansion of the dump. So what you will see here is the expansion of the external vessel. And you will also see the effect of the two upstream and downstream windows which will move at different times due to the inertia of the system. So, and again, the one that you're seeing here, it's an event that, I mean, it's a slow event. Uh, basically, it occurs in 90 microse in some hundreds of milliseconds, so after the beam impact, but of course here is slow down uh, for, uh, for you to have a look at that. So you can really see this uh, expansion, this breathing mode, the longitudinal mode of the dump, uh, that of course gets reflected back and forth. Uh, and you see the effect here of this vibration of the window. So of course, it's expanded in the longitudinal direction. So what you see here, this movement is basically 10 millimeter, which again, it's a lot, considering that the thickness of the window itself is 10 millimeter. So um, we did several modifications during this shutdown in order to try to mitigate this effect, because of course, at least with the current design of the dump, we cannot remove that. This is really comes from physics but we can only mitigate the evaporation effects. And basically, a part of physically separating the dump from the vacuum of the LHC to increase the reliability of the entire system, we also suspended the dump on two steel ropes. So here you see the dump, uh, this entire assembly, on which we uh, welded the uh, intermediate supports, which then gets engaged in this rope that you see here. So it gets this middle part gets engaged in this bottom uh, assembly to, to solidarize basically the rope onto the dump. And this basically allows the dump to, goes back, to go back to the initial position after a, a dump event. So we have several challenges from, from um, say starting from next year and already doing now, because uh, a part of checks and to validate our simulation package, it's clearly what we saw in, uh, in uh, last year, basically, is that uh, the material inside the actual dump is actually already damaged. So, so it's something that we need to be carefully study because we need to guarantee the operation of this assembly for run three and then later on uh, for, uh, for, H for HC. So it was very quick uh, excursus, uh, but I just want to raise the point that beam intercepted devices are multi-physics, multi-expertise, and I would call it cross-cultural system that engage and in, in, requires working together with several competence, not only you know, physicists, engineers, but also with people that work with vacuum, transport, uh, 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 the main workshop. So it's really an interesting approach. And um, clearly the reliable construction and operation of this device uh, relies on very delicate balance between requirements and constraints. And as a last point, I just want to mention that the operational experience is really a key aspect in the uh, iteration loop uh, for the design of new generation components for the future generation machines. Thanks a lot. And sorry, I take a bit more time than what I was given. That's all right. Thank you so much, Marco. I think 
it was incredibly interesting. I think it was like a very, as you said, like a very complex topic. And the way it was explained, actually, I was like actually very entertained by it. Like besides, I've never seen it from this angle also. So um, thank you very much. Yeah. And so I would like to open the floor for questions. I think you can open, I think you can like raise your hand tool um, or post it in the chat as you wish. Frédéric, please go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the very nice overview, Marco. Um, just a quick question. You touched on some of the challenges of the LHC beam dump, and we can see there are quite a lot of challenges, especially with the new beams and new levels of energy coming with high luminosity LHC. Um, how, how are we going to do for FCC? Because I suspect the level of energy will be even a lot more than, than they will be in the next years. Uh, is that an option to distribute some dumps around the rings? Or well, do we I... have Let's make a separation. I think you're talking about FCC HH because yes. for FCC EE, at the end, we do have a design. We have a, a, a PhD student that has worked on that. So we have a preliminary design of the FCC EE dump system uh, based on a semi passive assembly. Still, it's going to be challenging because there's a very small electron beam at 20 megajoule stored energy. But uh, okay, it seems that we do have a, some, at least on a conceptual level, technical solution. In the case of FCC HH, I think it's so far away in the future, especially now that FCC EE in any case will come first before FCC HH. So before FCC EE was prioritized with respect to FCC HH, we did some studies onto a system that would be, um, let's say, uh, still based on an approach which is very similar to the one of the LHC based on a dilution system, but much more diluted beam with respect to what we have now for the, for the LHC. And uh, uh, I think, well, our idea was to build up on top of the experience that we will have, or that we will make for the, uh, for the HLHC beam dump, which also will be quite different uh, from the one that we are managing now. So we do have some path, but the, the idea at the moment is still to be based on a dump system which is located in a specific point and extracted in two dedicated caverns uh, far away from the uh, from the from the tunnel for, for FCCHH. For FCCEE, the idea still is to have an extraction from the cavern, not an internal dump, but uh, uh, located into a straight section of the FCCEE machine. Because of course the radiation level are different than the one that we have on a on a hydro machine. I don't know if I reply to your question on, on this, but uh, we do yeah, well, have some ideas for FCC HH. Okay, good. Good to know. Thanks. All right. Uh, so I think we can move on to Jens. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, first of all, Marco, thank you for the very nice presentation. Uh, I'm uh, decommissioning uh, a cyclotron, the cyclotron of our university myself. So I can imagine some of the challenges you must be facing um, at, at, at the different parts that you're working on. Uh, but I was just um, uh, wondering what, what, again, with uh, in my mind, decommissioning of, of these things and the radioactive waste that you have, um, what are the time scales of decommissioning? Because usually the um, uh, a, a run is usually, well, or a shutdown is usually just a couple of years. Um, what, what kind of time scales do you have for decommissioning and what, yeah. what exactly does CERN do with its radioactive waste? I actually don't know this. Uh, do you it's store a, it yourself or, or um, do you reuse it in another way? Or yeah. It's I, a very pertinent question. It's very interesting. And uh, well, I have to admit, this is not really my group responsibility. But clearly, we work very closely together with the radio uh, with the um, uh, with radiation protection, especially with the waste section of radiation protection, also because we are the producer of the highest radioactivity components, not only in my section, but in general in the group, we also have the operation of the ISOL, the facility, where we have uranium carbides targets, where we have actinides inside. So um, let's put it this way. So CERN has an agreement with, uh, with, with France and Switzerland for the disposal of waste. So we can only dispose waste in these two countries. And uh, um, uh, 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 CERN has to say has several pathways for low radioactive waste and for medium, let's say, uh, medium level uh, waste. 
And um, let's say what we have to do as equipment owner, uh, we, um, our objective is to try to help the organization in general radio and, and the radioactive protection team uh, to be able to dispose these components relatively easily when the time would come to dispose them. So usually the process in getting the authorization and opening the path for disposal is extremely long. So it's much longer than a couple of years, okay? So it's, it, there is a very important point here, which is the knowledge transfer. Because we, re, we remove a component now from the machine, we know very well how it's done, how it's made, how it has been operated, the history of that. But from this moment where we remove this component from the machine to the moment that somebody will send it to you know, Switzerland or France, you may have 15, 20 years, okay? People may be gone from CERN, people may be doing different things within the organization and may have forgotten all this piece of information. So clearly documentation is an extremely important topic and needs, this is really a must. And there is also another point, which is, the fact of um, trying to do um, waste reduction and waste, uh, let's say, packaging um, uh, as early as possible, okay? So that when the time will come that RP will have to dispose of, it will, the waste package would be already in a shape that can be relatively easily handleable. So we are in editing, or let's say, the radioactive waste section is inheriting a situation in the past where these things were not even thought, if I may say so. So, so, so now we are entering into a different process where we, we have to make, because it's very expensive for the organization as well. So this is not cost neutral, disposing waste costs a lot of money. And this money is taken away, for example, from physics program. So it's, it's clearly very important. And I think everybody now is recognizing that this is very important to act as early as possible to make a package which can be disposed. One of the examples, which I was not able to touch, <clears throat> is that um, we, are, we are doing the autopsy on one of the radioactive LHC beam dump, I just briefly mentioned in one line. So, and uh, of course our objective is to, you know, understand how the material have suffered from beam irradiation uh, in order to make better device for the future. But since we, what we, what we wanted is that since we, we are going to cut this object uh, in several pieces. Then we started a discussion with our HSC colleagues to make sure that we profit from this step to try to already prepare the dump for, um, um, say, package the dump for final disposal. So we do some extra mile at this stage, but we believe that it's worth doing the effort because we will, we will avoid doing that in 10 years from now, maybe where maybe all of us will do a different thing. So, so I think it's very, very important. And your question is very pertinent because at least on our side, uh, we are really pushing forward to the limit of to the extent that is possible to try to do that. There is another example, which is the ISO, the targets. Uh, th th there is an important uh, effort here that, 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 that CERN is doing in general to try to separate waste so that uh, every type of material will go to a separate waste path, which again will reduce cost to the organization and will help uh, get rid of this waste uh, at the appropriate uh, location. Thank you very much, it's very clear. All right, so I think we're slightly over time. Uh, so thanks again, Marco, and thank Apologies you for being late. No, 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 it's not anyone's fault. So like, thank you for the very interesting presentation and thanks for uh, the questions. I think I will now hand it back to Rachel. Thank you so much again, Marco and Christina. I really thank enjoyed you. as well. I enjoyed all of it, but I really like the robots. I don't know, did the robots come from, are they developed at CERN or are they bought commercially? Some of them are commercially, some of them are uh, been uh, developed by the robotics team uh, here yeah. at CERN. But I think the, the special way is the way they are operated and the way we are using them uh, mm. in our uh, applications. Yeah. yeah, perhaps another subject for, for news from the lab. Yeah. So thank you so much to all of you. And uh, from the whole of the alumni relations team, I wish everybody um, a very Merry Christmas and happy holidays. And we look forward to seeing you in 2022.